Welcome to the Mind Design Sports Podcast. I'm Brandon, and in each episode, I'll be talking about sports psychology with the guest speaker. If you want to design your sports experience, you've come to the right place. If you want more tips and insights on how to improve your sports performance mentally, check out our website and other podcasts at mind-designsports.org. Hi, this is Brandon from Mind Design Sports, and I'm here today with Emily Galvin. Emily is a certified mental skills trainer and a performance consultant. As a former three-sport athlete, she understands the challenges and rewards that result from pushing the body and mind work as one. She's the co-founder of Summit Performance Consulting, which is a consulting service for individuals and teams to maximize their sport performance. In today's podcast, Emily will help us understand energy management as it relates to sports. Thank you for joining us, Emily, and I'm excited to learn more about you from you today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Is there anything else you would like to share about yourself that I didn't mention? Um... I guess the only other thing right now is that, you know, I have three little kids, so I've been doing, you know, being home a lot this past year almost. I've been kind of putting into action a lot of my own mental skills (laughs) training to balance everything. How did you get introduced to sports psychology and why did you wind up studying it and being a performance consultant? So when I was in my undergrad program, I was taking a social psychology class, and I think I was a sophomore, and at the end of the class, my professor was just introducing us to psychology in different fields. So we talked about psychology in law, for example. We also talked about psychology in sport. And at that point, I had already started to gravitate toward counseling and psychology for my undergrad. I just felt sort of called to that type of helping profession. So when I, you know, growing up as a three-sport athlete in basketball, soccer, and track, I obviously really loved sports and athletics. And learning about psychology in sport felt like a nice combination of two of my passions. I continued with my psychology degree. Um, The school where I went at the time didn't have a sports psych program, but I took classes that set me up to be able to get into a master's program. And then I got my master's in sports psychology and ultimately my certification as a certified mental performance consultant. Sounds good. There's not a lot of information out there about energy management in sports. Can you talk about what it is and the different components that make it up? Energy management in sport, and in particular in sport psychology, really refers to all of the activation going on inside your body. So we think of energy certainly as being really hype or really excited, and you have all this energy, and you're kind of running all over the place. But really, we want to make sure that I want to make sure when I'm working with athletes that athletes have the right amount of energy or activation going on inside their body that works for them. So I don't know if maybe anyone who's listening to this, if you can picture when you played or if you're playing a sport right now in the locker room, are you that athlete who likes to be sort of bouncing off the walls and really hype? Or are you the athlete that maybe has her headphones in? you're listening to music, you're kind of off on your own a little bit. That's already your way of showing that you understand the ideal level of energy you need to play at your best. When I'm using this word activation, what I mean is just the physical activity going on inside your body. So if I'm talking with an athlete, I might say, you know, what does it feel like for you to be nervous? And a lot of times we'll talk about heart racing, feeling jittery, feeling butterflies in your stomach, a little bit sweaty or sweaty palms. All of those things have to do with the energy or activation that's inside your body. So when I work with an athlete and we talk about energy management, it's really about finding the ideal level of activation or activity going on inside your body that works for you. So for a lot of us, we like to be at least a little bit nervous because that gives us a sense of focus. Um, But sometimes being way too nervous or way too hype and having way too much of that activation can really throw us off our game. Um, So that is certainly how I go about it from a professional standpoint. I also think when you look at it from an applied standpoint within a competition, you also have to think about energy in the sense of what kind of energy do I have coming into my body and what kind of energy am I putting out? 
I know enough about nutrition that I can have these kinds of conversations with athletes. But if you can think about it as balancing out weights on a scale, you know, you need good fuel on the one end, like to fill up that bucket or to fill up that side of the weight to be able to have, you know, fuel, what I mean is by with nutrition, um, the things that you're putting into your body before you play, you need to have what you need to produce the output, to produce the level of energy that you need for the kind of level of performance that you want. So it's really, there's a lot that goes into that topic. And I think for some people who aren't as much in the sports psych literature, you know, energy really just seems like how much actual energy do I have to be able to last this whole game without burning out or without totally running out of steam or running out of gas, so to speak. But it is also about recognizing and being able to consistently get to that ideal activation level and manage your nerves and manage your excitement before and during competition. That was a pretty long-winded answer, but hopefully that's kind of getting to the point of your question. Yeah, that was great. So does energy management have to involve like arousal and how we are aroused? Yes, definitely. It seems like you have a little bit of know-how into the sports psych literature because yes, that's exactly what it would be talking about is like arousal is the same as that activation that I was talking about. So if you're an athlete listening to this and you're thinking, huh, this sounds interesting, but I don't really know how this relates to me. A really simple exercise you can do is to think about your last really good practice or your last really good game and think, how was I feeling? Was my heart racing before I played? Was I super nervous, if you would call it that? Did I have butterflies in my stomach? Um, Was I that person bouncing off the walls? Or am I realizing I do actually like to be a lot calmer and when I don't take that time to myself to center myself, to listen to music, to, you know, use my self-talk, to run through some visualization, whatever it is that you're doing, you know, then I realize I don't play well because I'm a little bit too frazzled. So it's everything to do with your arousal level or your activation level and beefing up your self-awareness enough that you know what works for you and then you use strategies to help you get to that activation level consistently. I see. What are the benefits besides the more obvious one, like controlling your energy and arousal? It may be like being more focused. Yeah. So the benefits to successfully managing your energy I would say, yes, certainly being more focused falls into that because with the example I just gave, if you're way too activated and have way too much energy, you might find yourself being a little bit reckless and kind of all over the place and that can really hurt your focus. That also really plays into confidence. I think when you recognize your ideal level of activation or energy for a game, it can really contribute to your confidence. If you've already done the the reflective work to figure out that your ideal level of energy is somewhere in the middle, you like to be like a little pumped up, but also not too out of control. And you've already recognized that when you can get yourself to that place, that's when you know you produce your best performances. That's when you have your best games, your best races. So that too plays into your level of confidence. You know that you've set yourself up absolute best you can to give yourself an opportunity to have the best possible performance. But I also think that proper energy management can just help you overall be more consistent. So whether you play on a team or you're an individual athlete, if you play on a team and you're more consistent, that helps your teammates trust you more. You can consistently play your role. Uh, which makes you a really valuable contributor on the team. If you're an individual athlete, you have, if you're more consistent, you can probably pinpoint your expectations for certain competitions or races a lot better, which can help you set more effective goals and um, kind of get your motivation in place. So I do think a lot really stems from recognizing how you'd play your best, how you like to feel, And then 
making it an intentional, deliberate part of your pregame routine to get yourself to whatever that energy level is, because everything sort of falls from that or everything goes from that base point. Yeah, interesting. Does energy management also incorporate the mental and emotional energy aspects? So for example, can something emotional or mental drain our physical energy? That's a really good question. And yes. (laughs) So the first example that comes to my head when you say that is maybe an athlete who, who has ever had an experience of having a coach who really rides him and gets on him a lot and is maybe really overly critical. And that can take a real emotional strain on an athlete. At the very least, it can really take away your focus both of which can start to eat away at your actual physical play. So I do think that when we talk about energy, we do very often think of just the energy that we have in our body, but it can be very emotionally draining to be dealing with a lot of mental energy issues because we put all of our thought into that and where our what we're telling ourselves really drives what we do with our body. So if we're finding that coach is being really critical and saying like you're not getting to these balls or you keep missing these passes or whatever it is, you might start to tell yourself I need to work harder. I need to do this better, do this faster. Um we start to sometimes overcompensate and expend more physical energy because of where our mental energy is, where our mental focus is. So I do think that the mental or emotional energy that we're dealing with and thinking of like what's the input and what's the output and the physical energy that I've described are very closely tied. And it's really quite impossible (laughs) to separate them because our mind and body are always connected. So I, I definitely think that it is possible to feel a drain of emotional energy. And then quickly, the flip side of that is if you've ever experienced momentum or if you've ever made that like huge important shot in a game or your teammate has and you just feel that surge because you're excited, because your self-talk is starting to be like, okay, we got this, we can turn it around or we can hold on to this lead. And your body takes a cue from your mind in that regard too. So So it can go in both directions in terms of kind of amping up your energy, for better or for worse, or draining it. You said before that sometimes coaches um, really get on their players' mistakes and that drains their mental energy. What would Mm -hmm. be your advice for those athletes? Yeah, good question. So it's a tough spot to be in to have a, a coach like that. Ultimately, you have to focus on what you can control. I know that's a lot easier said than done, but what I mean by that is putting your mental energy on things that you actually have the capacity to change or to affect in some way. So unless you think you'll be able to have, you know, ask coach to meet sometime during the week or after practice, and you think you're actually going to have a productive conversation about how coach talks to you, you know, if that doesn't sound like something that's going to happen in your relationship with your coach, then really what you need to do is try to pay very close attention to what you're letting your attention go to in a game, in a practice. So if your coach is kind of shouting from the sideline all the time, and you therefore are listening all the time, and you're taking that in all the time, and you're internalizing whatever that feedback is, which hopefully isn't really overly critical and like telling you you're no good or things like that. But unfortunately, sometimes it is. And if that's all we're putting our focus on and we internalize that, that can really have really negative effects on not only how we perform, but also how we feel about ourselves as an athlete or even as a person. So in my advice to focus on what you can control, I think there are a few things you can do there. So one, you can anticipate that that is what you're going to get from your coach. I'm going into a game. I know coach is always really critical. I'm going to expect that. And why would I 
you know, advise that because then it's not a surprise to you. It doesn't throw you off. You don't feel like you don't feel really frustrated. Like, oh, now coach is suddenly screaming at me. What's going on? You just sort of take it as, yep, okay, this is what I knew would happen and it's happening just like I planned. So once you start getting that critical feedback, you can think, is there anything in this that is helpful? Yes. Okay. So even though he's calling me names or he's saying this and that, he is telling me I need to pay closer attention to um, being in position off the ball. Okay. Something like that. So I'm going to take that. And now I'm going to just focus my energy, focus my attention on putting that into play and getting back into things that I can control, which is what I'm doing on the field or court, how I'm communicating with my teammates. You know, if you're an individual athlete and you're running, for example, you know, on my technique, anything like that. So that can be a really tough position to be in, but ultimately focusing on what you can control does help you maintain that sense of control, which is really huge in your feelings of motivation, your ability to focus on productive things, um, your ability to cover, recover from mistakes. So a lot of things go into that feeling of having control. Yeah. I also think like another tip to countering those coaches that really get on your mistakes a lot is to try to find like the little bits of constructive criticism behind what the coach says, Mm because There might be some stuff he says that actually may help you, but it's just said in a disrespectful way. But Mm -hmm. if you take it a different way, it might be helpful. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Right. So can someone manage their energy through yoga or meditation? Yes. So both yoga and meditation share the foundational element of being in tune with your body, with your mind with your breath. Those are both really important pieces to both of those exercises. So I think in deciding to engage in yoga, doing meditation, whatever that might be for you, because meditation can look a lot of different ways for a lot of different people. It can help you manage your energy because it helps you develop a much deeper sense of self-awareness. It helps you understand how your breath impacts your body. So for example, if you are sitting right now listening to this and you think, you know, I I wonder how my breath (laughs) impacts my body. I'm breathing all the time, 24-7, obviously, and I don't really pay much attention to it. If you decide, okay, for the next even 30 seconds. I'm going to breathe really shallowly. I'm only going to let my breath come to my chest. I'm not going to let it flow all the way down into my belly, kind of diaphragmatic breathing. You'll find that it feels like you're hyperventilating, which kind of triggers a little bit of a stress response from your body, kind of a fight or flight type of feeling. Your heart rate's going to increase. You might start to feel a little lightheaded even. You might start to recognize your blood pressure is kind of increasing. Whereas if you sit and you decide, I'm actually going to try to make my breath even deeper by inhaling through the nose, holding my breath for a couple seconds, and exhaling a longer exhale than my inhale, and do that over and over for maybe five, eight deep breaths, you'll recognize how that starts to uh, impact how your body feels in terms of your heart rate, in terms of your blood pressure, um, any kinds of jitters. Recognizing, so kind of to bring this all back together, both yoga and meditation really drive home this idea of understanding breath and breath work. And that has a huge impact on your energy management, on the activation that you're feeling in your body. Breath work is an excellent strategy to use when you're feeling a little bit too amped up in a game or you're on the foul line and you're recognizing your nerves are just skyrocketing you know taking a couple effective deep diaphragmatic breaths can really help you reset your activation in your body in that moment Um, so i certainly think that having any kind of routine practice that helps you try to quiet your mind and pay attention to your body and just learn your body more 
is a great introduction to understanding your body and being able to regulate, which is really the goal of mental skills training, having the self-awareness that you can self-regulate on a more regular basis. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and doing research on the on this topic, I noticed that getting sleep, getting enough sleep comes up every time, and it seems to be the foundation for boosting energy. Yet most kids and adults don't get enough sleep. So, can you speak to how sleep really does affect focus and our energy? I've been fortunate enough to, in some of my previous jobs working with sports psych, to work alongside some sports scientists who have a lot of information about sleep and what's actually going on in your body. So a few things I've picked up on, I know that sleep is so important for your body to consolidate. So mentally to consolidate things that you've learned, you know, you're picking up information throughout the day, just your, it's information overload. And in particular, thinking about, you know, the role of an athlete, if you've learned certain plays that day, or you've gone through drills and practice like that sleep is a time for your mind to consolidate all of that, which means store it away, you know, commit it to memory, so to speak. But sleep is also physically a time where your body can repair itself. It replenishes its energy. It can repair, uh, start to work on repairing your muscles, which if you lift or if you push your body past, you know, beyond what you've done before, that's because the process of that is to break down your muscles so that you can build them back up stronger. And sleep is absolutely vital in that process. When you don't get enough sleep, that's when you risk over time injury or overtraining syndrome. And a lot of times people just don't quite get enough sleep because they don't have good sleep routines and good sleep habits. So Anyone listening to this right now, I'm wondering, you know, do you fall asleep in your bed, like on social media or looking at your phone or something? That's a really, you are just absolutely engaging your brain and just sending it the message that everything needs to wake up and be ready. Because not only are you on social media or texting or whatever, you're also staring at this bright screen, you know? So a lot of us, we just don't have really effective and sleep routines that can, over time, really start to condition our body to start unwinding, to start slowing down, to start getting ready to go to sleep. Yeah, a lot of us fall into that category of being sleep deprived, whether just a little bit or really quite a lot. Um, and if we pay closer attention to our routines in time that's something that a lot of us can really um you said so athletes only are really busy and they only have time probably in the night to check their phone and important emails and they have to just get ready for practice and games in the morning so what would you say to an athlete that's super busy and has no other choice but to check their phone at night when they have to go to bed i would say to Write down a list of all the things that you do in a day and when and where you're doing them. Because, and I fall into this category too. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, I sort of had to reset my nighttime routine and make, and leave my phone out of my room. I was recognizing myself falling back into that habit as well. I think that you will find that there are certain things you do in a day that you could either do for a lesser amount of time, or you could do not at all and free up space for whatever you're doing at night right before bed that you think is important enough that yes, you do need to do it, but that's not the right time to be doing it. Even if you flip flop them. So you put your email checking and this and that to be the 15 minutes leading up to dinner or while you're on the car ride home from practice or, um, you know, whenever that might be. And instead, before bed, you're doing something different, um, something else from from your day. But ultimately, I think that the if you are doing that kind of exercise, writing things down and thinking like, I can't, you know, I can't get rid of anything, or I don't want to take time away, really challenge yourself to think like, how is this behavior serving me? All these things on my list are, and I don't think I can get rid of any of them. What are they bringing to me? Are they making me feel 
uh, happy and fulfilled? Are there, do they have a purpose? Some of these things I really don't like doing, but I absolutely have to for school. And so the purpose with that is to make sure I'm in good academic standing and I'm really making the most of my education. So if you're finding that you go through that and you think this is pointless, this hasn't helped me at all, I encourage you to dig deeper and try to only keep the things on there that are necessary and that are really serving you. And one final thing to add to that is to, if you kind of want to work backwards and think, if I were to be getting a full restorative night of sleep every night, how would that change my day to day? How would that change my mood and my behavior? How would that change my mornings? How would that change the amount of energy I have by the afternoon when I need to be practicing? How would that serve you? And that maybe can be some motivation to make a few changes if you have to. What is an example of really cutting something out or lessening the time of for a younger athlete? Sometimes I feel a little out of touch with what <laughs> what you guys are all doing these days. But if I'm thinking like, okay, there might be times in the day where you are commuting and instead of just like being on Instagram or TikTok, you could do whatever it is that you're, you know, checking your email or sending a message to someone that needs to get sent while you're in the car. So doing something like that. So cut out that just like mindless time on social media and put in something that you need to do there. Or if you have um, pretty much anything just kind of mindless that doesn't serve you. I think we don't realize how many things like that we do in the day. Even if it's a study hall where, or, you know, a free period where you really like being able to spend that time with your friends and like you're kind of doing some work, but you're kind of just like chit-chatting. Could you take the first five minutes or the first 10 minutes of that period and just check that box, get that stuff done, and then you know, the rest of the time you're spending how you want to spend it. Yeah, I'm just circling back to energy management and energy management research focuses on runner's high and sports addiction too. Uh, Can you explain a little bit about that? And is there a relationship between runner or sports addiction and managing energy? So I'm not as familiar with this. I know that, so the feeling of runner's high comes from the hormone or like the neurochemical of um, endorphins. So the way that endorphins work in our body, and so endorphins are released when when you do various things. So even, you know, eating dark chocolate, for example, can release some endorphins in your body. But exercise um, and running, obviously, as a form of exercise, which is where you get this idea of runner's high, is also a really big trigger for releasing endorphins in your body. And the way endorphins work in your body is actually really quite similar to some drugs. And so the the chemical process of it is similar to how some drugs act in the brain. So it can give you this feeling of euphoria and it sort of um, dampens your pain receptors for a bit. So it's like this runner's high, but it's also this feel no pain type of a thing going on in your body. So... I imagine that in, and this is just sort of speaking of what I know with endorphins and how they act on the body, I could see that could be connected to this idea of sports addiction or just sort of exercise addiction because you get so tuned into high kind of feel no pain type of feeling that you get really hooked on going back to it similar to how someone would get hooked on going back to a drug. Gotcha. Do you have any examples of how an athlete has applied energy management to effectively enhance your performance or maybe someone you've worked with or a famous athlete? Yeah, so I work on energy management quite often with the athletes I work with. And so uh, examples that are coming to mind right away are athletes who I'll go through exercises with them of enhancing that self-awareness and starting to identify how do you want to feel to play your best. And so with athletes, they will build pregame routines that help them effectively manage their energy. So for some of them, it's um, 30 minutes before a game, they're doing certain things to help themselves start to relax a bit. That's when they recognize that the nerves really start to get to them. Cognitively, they're starting to, their self-talk is getting a little 
um, off track for them. And that's affecting their nerves, which is making them feel more, uh, their heart's racing a little bit more. The butterflies are turning into bats in their stomach, so to speak. It's kind of terminology that I think works really well at the youth level that you want to turn, like make your butterflies fly in formation, basically, rather than letting your butterflies turn into bats. Something I've always liked when I work with um, a lot younger athletes, but we'll implement various things to help them bring their activation down at that point. So that's when, okay, where are you taking centering breaths in your routine? What sort of self-talk are you using? Is this when you start to implement your confidence boosting imagery? You sort of replay a highlight reel of your best plays and your best games. That starts to help you feel a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more confident and composed, which is a way that you're managing your energy. So, you know, and if you're an athlete who often comes out flat and it's, you know, it takes you five, 10 minutes to really get into it, you might need to up your energy. You need to manage your energy by boosting it a little bit more. So you can do that also with breath work, with taking more of those shallow type breaths and and triggering a little bit more of that stress response in your body, which increases your heart rate and gets you moving a little bit more. But you also might be using energizing imagery. So for example, if you're a swimmer, this might sound strange, but even visualizing yourself as a shark moving through the water, things like that, that really boost your energy through visualization. So the first step is really enhancing that self-awareness by reflecting on what has worked for me in the past, what hasn't, how did that feel, did I like that, did I not, did it produce good performance, did it not, and building your strategies into a routine so that you can use that routine to be consistent with getting to that ideal energy level. I see. Interesting. So you were an athlete in basketball, soccer, and track. So which hurdles did you personally face and how did you overcome them? Maybe uh, energy management or any other sports psych technique? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had kind of an interesting run with, with my sport career. My high school teams were just not that great. <laughs> so we just had a lot of adversity, a lot of un unexpected setbacks and things with um, certain players. So I was just constantly on losing teams. And that was hard for me. I'm a really competitive uh, athlete. And I really enjoyed the process of playing, but I also really wanted to win. <laughs> like The outcome was also important to me and a big piece of my motivation. And that was a big reason why I ran track, because in my area, um, I actually did pretty well with track. I was a sprinter, 100 meter, 200 meter, um, 400 meter, and some relays. And I did really well. I could win races. And I actually kind of hated running track, but I found that I was able to get that winning feeling, which I was totally lacking in the other seasons of the year with my other sports. But I would say that part of why I think I was so drawn to sports psychology is that I really didn't know how my mindset and how my thoughts, how much they affected my body and therefore my performance. I really wish that I had known more about this and I could have leveraged my mindset and been able to pay more attention or be more intentional with how I was using my mind. Um, for example, <laughs> I know you're looking for like, what did I use? But here's kind of the opposite is how bad it was in a sense. Every time my coach, my track coach would sort of surprise me with telling me I had to run the four by four, um, the 400 meter relay in track. And I always had to anchor it, which, you know, I ran the last leg and he would just surprise me. He'd spring it on me in the at the end of the meet, because it was always the last meet, or the last event in the meet, excuse me, and I would just immediately start having like this panic feeling. It was a tough race for me to run, just because it's a really physically taxing race, and I just absolutely hated it, and so he would tell me, and I would just spend the next 
you know, 10, 20 minutes, however long it was till the race, just psyching myself out and thinking about how much it was going to hurt and I was going to be last and what if we're this far behind or what if we're just a tiny bit ahead and I have to stay in the lead for the whole race. And it was really difficult for me to deal with that over and over. So the long and short of it is that I really didn't have a lot of strategies. I would say with one of my coaches, I really started to employ that that idea of focusing on what you can control um, a lot better. I also had a, a foul shot routine that I would use where I would tell myself, I can't quite remember, but something about like how I was going to follow through and I would take a breath. So I had a little bit of a routine there. But ultimately, I look back and sometimes I find myself wondering, I wonder how much better of an athlete I could have been if I understood at all how much my mindset affected my performance. Yeah. So if you were to just play soccer and basketball and you didn't have the option of track, but you kept losing, what would you have done? Good question. I guess I would have just kept dealing with it. I'm a very vocal person and I like being in environments where I feel empowered to speak up for the betterment of the group. So I did find myself earning leadership roles on my teams. So I do recall that I really was doing what I could do to try to help us win and try to contribute. So I think I would have probably had to just keep going on with what we were doing, but really try to emphasize the ways in which I was focusing on what I could control and the way I was leaning into those things I could control, like being an effective leader on the team, always giving 100% at practice, always giving 100% in games, communicating with teammates, communicating with my coach, being a liaison between the team and coach, um, and just really being committed to being the best player and importantly the best teammate I could be so at least then if you're measuring your success based on those controllable factors being the best player you can be the best teammate you know your communication how much you're trying to boot like intentionally develop your confidence if those are also success measures for you then even if you lose every single game you play or you lose every single race you play or you play second instead of first, you know, those less controllable outcome-based goals, you can still feel successful if you are measuring yourself based on those controllable things. So I think looking back, I would have made sure that I was staying focused on those controllable metrics to measure my success. Even though I still wanted to win, (laughs) you know, if that's your only success measure, then you stand the risk of never achieving that perhaps, and therefore having to struggle with how that affects your motivation or how it affects your confidence, even how it affects your, your drive to stick with the sport. Absolutely. Um, I know you said you could talk about flow and you have a little bit of info on that, but mm-hmm. we already have a podcast on that. And I don't want to be too repetitive. So do you have anything to add on to flow besides that? It is when athletes feel like completely engaged in their performance and concentrate on the moment and perform at really high levels. Yeah. So what I would add to that is just that over the past um, decade, there's been a lot of research on what's actually going on in your brain when you get into flow or get into the zone. Uh, And it's really interesting. I know we've talked a little bit about endorphins here, but it's this cycle of pairing these changes with the hormones and neurochemicals in your body with um, the change in your brain waves. So basically, when you actually get into flow, it starts with your body, with your brain being in this this struggle period where essentially everything's really ramped up. You have sort of a fight or flight response going on in your body. You have a stress chemical of cortisol and adrenaline or epinephrine kind of pumping through you. And your brain waves are really all over the place. They're kind of going crazy. And then if you can try to get out of your own way by maybe taking a walk or doing something that allows yourself to 
release that rather than like getting really frustrated and trying and giving up or just trying to like power through and bulldoze through the problem if you give yourself a little time to step away from it you experience this release so nitric oxide pumps through your body it you know lowers your blood pressure and lowers your heart rate and it your brain waves start to slow down with along with that and that's when your body can get into flow or when your brain can get into flow and when we're in flow this is kind of like what you talked about with that you know exercise addiction these happy hormones and neurochemicals are just flowing through your brain so dopamine i know i'm kind of blanking right now on the rest of them but endorphins actually that's what endorphins are yeah so it feels great and what's so interesting is that your your brain waves are as slow as they would be if you were in a deep meditative state so what's so cool about that is you're actually using so much less of your brain in order to do more and that comes up a lot with athletes when they overthink things when they override the automatic things their bodies know how to do so if you're taking a foul shot for example and you know yesterday you took 100 foul shots and you made 80 of them and even the ones you missed it just felt really fluid it felt really good but now here you are in a game and you're under pressure and you're thinking about the score and you're thinking about okay if we miss are we going to get the or if i miss am i they are we going to get the rebound if i make it but what you have all these thoughts going on you're using so much of your brain and that can negatively affect your performance. So in flow, you're actually using a lot less of your brain. Those brain waves are really slow and your body's kind of taking over. Um, so I just think that's really interesting. I think it has really big impacts on how athletes can perform. And I think it's really encouraging to know that you can sort of hack your own habits to get yourself into flow, um, which I know you mentioned like we have some information on flow. We have a flow program that we offer um, called the flow formula. And that's teaching you how to figure out what habits can you hack and what systems can you get in place to try to be in flow more consistently. Yeah, of course. And for the younger athletes that might feel overwhelmed with the details, what simple ways can they build effective energy management or really any sports psych tips into their life? I would start... I know this might not sound super appealing to some athletes, but the absolute foundation of success with mental skills, with mental toughness, mental training is having a level of self-awareness. You need to know what works for you and what doesn't, because if you know you need to be calm before a game, then you put in the strategies in place that you need to be calm. If you know that once the ref makes two, three, four bad calls, that's when you start to really lose it and you need some emotional management techniques. You need to know those things about yourself before you can put the strategies in place to regulate yourself, which is how you produce consistently good performance. So knowing yourself requires paying attention to yourself. It requires some self-reflection. So I would encourage, I, I do this with the highest level of athletes I work with. I do it with youth athletes as well. I would encourage you to do an objective evaluation, which I just simply call a well, better, how. After a practice, you write down what went well, what could I have done better, how can I do it better tomorrow? So you're paying attention to the good, you're paying attention to what needs to be improved, and you're making a plan for how you can improve it the next day. Over time, that becomes all this data about yourself. It becomes all this information about what what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And you'll also see yourself turning those what needs to be betters into the things that went well, which can also be a confidence booster. So I would say to stop leaving things up to chance and to start tuning into what's working for you and what's not working for you um, physically and mentally, because that gives you an opportunity to be more intentional. Do you think putting all that information in a spreadsheet would be useful so you could look back on past things to work on? 
Definitely, definitely. Yeah, in whatever way works. I know a lot of athletes like to use journals a lot, spreadsheets and, um, you know, Google Sheets, things like that, where they can see it all in one place is definitely, that's always advice I give. So, yeah, good, good follow up. So those are all my questions. So are there anything else that you want to address? Um, maybe another sports like technique or really anything? Um, I think maybe a final thought for anyone listening is just to think, how would you answer this question? What percent, what percentage of success in sport for you is based on your physical game and what's based on your mental game? So whether you're saying eh, it's kind of 50, 50, it's 80% physical, 20% mental, maybe it's 80% mental, 20% physical. Cause I play absolutely great every single practice and I get into a game and I never know what I'm going to get. Whatever that percentage is, how much, what percentage of your time training for your sport do you spend training your body? And what percentage do you spend training your mind? So that's not to say if you think sport is 50% mental, 50% physical, that you should take a, you know, 10 hour training week and put five of them to using visualization and writing confidence scripts and whatever that might be. But just kind of check in with yourself. If you think your mental game is important and it really has an influence on your overall success, you should spend some time being intentional with training it, not leaving it up to chance, not just deciding like, oh, right now I happen to be thinking about my self-talk, really committing to training that part of your performance if you recognize the value in it yeah that sounds great that's great that's a great thought and i guess that's everything i wanted to cover and i appreciate you coming on the podcast i thought everything you had to say was great and um if there's any if there's not anything else then i guess we'll finish okay yeah thank you so much brandon it's been really enjoyable thanks for having me thank you Thanks for listening to the My Design Sports Podcast. Before you leave, please show some love for the podcast by subscribing, liking, and commenting. Stay tuned for next month's podcast with a new guest speaker.